so we're going to start. Um, today, Ihan is going to talk to us about just join for parallel ordered sets. OK, so hello, everyone. This is Ihan. Today, I will talk about our work on parallel order sets using a single function join. And this is joint work with Gab Blalock and Daniel Ferenzovic. OK, so first, what is order set? An order set is a, a collection of elements with total ordering, such as a set of integers, strings, or any types with defined total ordering. So to implement order sets often requires some special data structures, such as arrays, linked lists, uh, and tree structures. And in this talk, we use balanced binary search trees as a data structure. I will talk about why and how later in this talk. So to implement uh, order sets, we should at least support lookup, insertion, deletion, and many other operations, and also some aggregate functions such as union, intersection, and difference. And in this work, we studied all these operations. But in this talk, I will introduce the most interesting part, which is the algorithms of these aggregate functions. I will introduce how to implement them in parallel, efficiently, and simply. OK, so these functions are just defined at their standard mathematical definition. But notice that they are on ordered sets. So keep the set elements in correct order is also very important. And in this talk, we will show how to build a framework to implement these aggregate functions using balanced binary search trees. And our goal is to make the framework efficient, parallel, and generic across multiple balancing schemes. So let's first look at these three goals one by one. And first, efficient. The definition of these aggregate functions are very simple, but efficient implementations are not. So let's take union as an example. Actually, many straightforward algorithms can do this work, but not efficient enough. To combine two ordered lists into another ordered structure is not a new problem to us. We've met this in uh, the same problem in merge sort. I believe that you are very familiar with this. We can store the sets in arrays and then merge them using two moving pointers. And the cost is order of n plus n. It is linear, but not good enough. In merge sort, we always have m equals to n. But in general, n can be much greater than m. And the work is still proportional to the larger size. Actually, it is not necessary to pay this much. So what's wrong with this? Actually, we have many parts, such as this 1, 2, 3 in set 2, that are preserved from the input to the output. But we still need to read and write them one by one, which is a waste of time. So to avoid this, we can store the sets in balanced binary search trees and inserting the elements of the smaller tree into the larger one. Obviously, this takes a time order of m log n and it is mainly decided by the smaller size. However, when n equals to m, it is order of n log m. But solution one will give us a linear algorithm. And the problem here is that we don't make good use of the ordered property of the first tree. So now we've seen that efficient union algorithm is not an easy task. And m plus n and m log n both are good in one case, but terrible in the other. So here the question is, generally, what is the optimal work union function costs? And let's analyze this in the comparison model. The comparison model evaluates the number of comparisons in the algorithm. And under this model, what union should do is, out of all the m plus n slots in the result array, choose m slots for those elements in set 1, or choose m for those in set 2, which are equivalent. And we, we need to use log base 2 of this many comparisons to distinguish them. If you do the math, it should be theta m log n over m plus 1. So to achieve our first goal of the framework, 
the efficiency, we want the algorithm at least asymptotically matches this bound. Actually, this bound is sublinear to the total size of the two sets. This means that we even don't need to touch all the elements in the two sets. If we use arrays to store sets, just to write back in correct order takes linear work. So we choose balanced boundary search trees as the, as the data structure because there can be many subtrees untouched and preserved. So is it possible to achieve this optimal bound using balanced BST? The answer is yes. Actually, there, are, there exist several algorithms using balanced BSTs to implement efficient set functions. And next, I will <coughs> introduce some previous works on that. This optimal bound was first matched by Brian Tajan using red-black trees. That algorithm is complicated and, compli and completely sequential. Later, Adams described very elegant algorithms for set functions based on weight balance trees. These functions are based on a single function join. And they are sequential, but can be made parallel easily. But the problem is that Adams never showed any interesting work bounds on those functions. He only informally claimed the bound to be order of n plus n, which is trivial. Then Blalock and Reed Miller extended Adam's algorithms to trips and made it parallel by defining the join function for trips specifically. This algorithm has optimal bound and achieved good parallelism. So, what's a trip? Um, trip is another balancing scheme of the trees that uh, in each node of the tree it keeps. Uh, random number as a priority, and so uh, the balancing criteria is that in the tree, a node must have higher priority than its two children, so it's balanced randomly. Okay, clear? Okay, so we've seen that all these existing algorithms are based on a specific balancing scheme, and it is actually hard to deal with multiple balancing schemes using a generic methodology. But the extension of Adam's algorithms to trips provide us an inspiration that a generic framework may be possible. Considering this, let's start with Adam's algorithms. Here's Adam's union algorithm on the two weight balanced trees. Now, you do not need to fully understand this at this point. I will introduce the details later. It has only seven lines, very simple and elegant. However, ever since then, no one has showed a tighter bound for this algorithm. So although it is correct and simple, the theoretical cost is its archer's heel. In our work, we extended it to multiple balancing schemes and also show that it matches the optimal bound not only on weight balance trees, but also other, uh, three other balancing schemes. Actually, you may find this algorithm actually has nothing to do with ba uh, weight balance trees. It is balancing scheme independent. And the secret lies in the two subroutines, split and join. Actually, this split can be implemented with join, also balancing scheme independent. So in this function, all balancing criteria can be captured by this single function join. And based on this, we design a generic framework of order set functions across multiple balancing schemes. So here comes our second goal, to hide the difference of the balancing schemes. So next, let me spend some time on balancing schemes. Under this framework, we discuss four balancing schemes, which are AVL <coughs> trees, red-black trees, weight balance trees, and trips. They are balanced with different criteria, such as height, size, or depends on the power of randomness. And the, difference, and the different balancing criteria aim at the same goal, to keep the height of the tree as low as possible. Ideally, it, is, uh, it should be order of log n. 
And for these four trees, we established a terminology rank. This quantity evaluates the balancing criteria for a tree node. For height balance trees, it is defined based on the height, and for the other two trees, we define based on the size. This terminology is used to simplify the analysis and proof in, of our algorithms. For example, in AVL trees, we always need to evaluate the height to see if the tree is balanced or not. But for weight balance trees, we need to evaluate the size. So with this rank defined, we can just uh, generally say, now let's pay attention to the rank. OK, so here I show the definition of rank uh, for each tree. For AVL trees, it is defined just as the height of the node. And for red-black trees, it is two times the black height when the node is black, and two times the black height plus one when it is red. <coughs> and for the other tr two trees, we simply defined to be log of the size. Now, you don't need to worry about the four definitions here, and the concrete definition will not play an important role in this talk. I just want to give you a sense of what rank is. You may find that even though the ranks are defined differently, they also follow intuition. You may have noticed some underlying variants. For example, two balanced subtrees usually have very close ranks, and the rank is always order of the height of the tree, so it is also order of the log of size. There are also many other good invariants in ranks which is very important in showing the optimality of our algorithms. We will come to that later. Now we have understand the first <coughs> two goals, and now I will talk about the third one, the parallelism. So how, how do we evaluate the, paral the parallelism of an algorithm? Now let me introduce you two basic uh, concepts in parallel algorithms. So to evaluate complexity of a parallel algorithm, we use two measurements. One is work, which is the total number of operations in the algorithm. You can view it just as the sequential time complexity. And the depth, which is the longest length of dependency chain. This is a little confusing, but you can view it as the parallel time to run this algorithm when we have an infinite number of processors. For example, this is a standard parallel algorithm to compute the sum of an, over, an array. We first add them in pairs in parallel and then repeat until there's only one result. This algorithm takes work order of n, which is the number of additions, and the depth, which is the longest chain of additions, one depends on the pre previous. Imagine even we can have infinite number of processors, you still to need to do log n additions in a row to get the result. So the depth is order of log n. <coughs> in parallel algorithm designing, the goal that we pursue delicately is to design algorithms with work asymptotically no more than their best sequential counterpart while still have low depth. So what will be considered as low depth? Generally speaking, polylog depths will, depths will perform well in practice. So these three goals can be summarized as optimal work, same interface, and uh, for the four balancing schemes, and low depth. With this in mind, let's look at how the framework works. And the first thing I will introduce is a magic function join. This function was first proposed by Tajan, but he didn't use it in set functions. This function takes two trees and one middle key as input, and the middle key k <coughs> is greater than all keys in the left tree and smaller than all keys in the right tree. Then this algorithm returns a BSDT containing all elements, including those in TL, TR, and K. So directly returning the concatenated tree may cause imbalance. So what will a join actually do? Here, for convenience, we suppose TR is larger 
and uh, drawing will go along the left spine in TR to find the subtree which has the same rank with TL or differs <coughs> by just a constant. The same rank roughly means, uh, means balance, remember? And then TL and this subtree in TR are connected and this new tree replaces the original tree. Now we've guaranteed that the subtree rooted at K, which is the red 4 here, is balanced. But the imbalance may still occur on its parent. Then like all the other BST operations, the drawing function will deal with this issue by rotating and finally return a valid BST. The rotations are tree specific, so we cannot avoid dealing with all the balance, different balancing criteria here. So join is different for all balancing schemes in the sense of rebalancing. But the high level idea is similar. I will not go in details of the four but different rebalancing algorithms. I only want to convey the high level idea of join here. And now let's analyze the cost of this function. Imagine this is an AVL tree and the algorithm will visit the root 10 and then 8 and find the correct connecting point at the 6 because it has the same, same height with the smaller tree. <coughs> so the nodes we, visit, we visited by the, uh, are the 10 and the 8. After connecting the two trees, we rotate along the way back and the possible nodes visited are also 8 and 10. So the number of nodes we visit on the path is no more than two times of the difference of the height. This is for AVL. So what about in general? Remember that we define a rank. So in general, it, this cost should be the difference of the ranks. OK, that's all for join. And next, I will introduce the function split, split. So let's pay attention to how it makes use of this join function and then hide the difference of the balancing schemes. This function is somehow the inverse of join. It takes a BSDT, a BSTT and a key K and split T into two parts. The left part TL contains all keys smaller than K and the right part TR contains those uh, larger than K. And also bit B is returned to indicate if K, K is found in the tree or not. I will show you an example to look at how the algorithm works. We want to split this tree by the <coughs> key 42 and we first search the key in the tree. Okay, we found it, so B is one. And the path to find k naturally splits tree into the left part and the right part. Those are tl and tr exactly. Let's see uh, the red part. There are two subtrees and a single node in the middle. Does this remind you something? OK, that's very good input for a join function. So, I, so we can just call join function whatever the balancing scheme is and the join function will be responsible to rebalancing the tree. So the split function itself doesn't need to worry about the balancing issue, and the code for split can be shared among all balancing schemes, which means we successfully hide the difference of the balancing schemes here. And similarly, we can join the left part layer by layer, and since the work of join is a difference of the rank, the cost of split should be the sum of these differences, which is RT1 minus RT2 plus RT2 minus RT3, and then this will cancel to be just the rank of the original tree. So now we are done with drawing the split, and are you all convinced that the split is balancing scheme independent? OK, so next I will go back to the seven line union code and you will see that with these two functions join and split, the union function is almost trivial. OK, the union code again. 
This function takes two BSTs, T1 and T2, as input, and it will return a BST containing the union of all elements in T1 and T2. And the first two lines are the base case, which, is, uh, which are trivial, and the main process lies in the next four lines. It is very simple. We first expose one tree to be the left subtree root and the right subtree, and we use the root K2 to split the other tree. <coughs> now T1 is broken up into L1 and R1 by the key 5, and T2 naturally have the left subtree and right subtree split by the key 5. So we recursively union the two parts smaller than 5 and the two parts greater than 5. <coughs> and these two unions can be done in parallel. And finally, we just call join to join the three parts together. Also, we can implement the intersection difference in a similar way. OK, so this algorithm is so simple that you may ask two questions. Is it efficient? And does it achieve enough parallelism? Even though atoms didn't show any interesting bonds, um, even on weight balance trees, after 24 years, we finally proved the strongest theorem here. For all the four balancing schemes, which are AVL trees, red-black trees, weight balance trees, and trips, this union algorithm or similar style intersection or difference on two balancing, balanced BSTs of size M and N has work order of M log N over M plus one. This is the optimal bound we just calculated minutes ago, and we have the polylog depth order of log M log N. <coughs> the proof for this seven-line code is not easy as, this, as it seems to be. Otherwise, Adam should have this done already. To make things worse, now we have four different balancing schemes and three set functions. <laughs> In total, 12 combinations. But don't worry, the next part is not about 12 proofs. <laughs> the good thing is that we gave one generic proof for all the balancing schemes and the set functions. And the key is to analyze based on the rank. OK. There are three good properties making the proof generic. First, after join, the rank increases by at most one. And second, after union, intersection, or difference, the result tree has rank at most the sum of the ranks of the two input trees. And third, in a tree of size n, there are at most the n over c to the i nodes of rank 2i or 2i plus 1, where c is at constant. These three properties of rank are general, balancing scheme independent, so we can first show that each balancing scheme satisfies all these three properties, and then show that these three properties are sufficient to prove the theorem. So these three properties are the bridge to connect the 12 combinations to one general theorem. At this theory launch, I want to spend some time on the idea of the proof. Due to the time limit, I will only talk about the work. OK. Let's look at the computational deck here. If we always choose the split pivot from T2, then each node in T2 will split one subset in T1. For example, in the very first step, the root 5 split the whole T1 into two parts. And then the two parts will be sent to its two children respectively, and then the two children Two, two children 2 and 7 split the two subtrees respectively and send the result to their children, and so forth. At the very bottom, we have the base case. Here we, sim uh, we simplify this figure. We don't show T1 anymore. We show a blue set instead. At the bottom level, if one tree is empty, we return the other tree directly, and re the recursive call ends. We know that each base case has constant cost, 
And here, this figure tells us that a split is followed by at most two base cases. So the number of base cases is no more than two times of the number of splits. So, so, so this, what is wrong here? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so the nodes of this tree are what? So uh, what, what, what are the nodes of this tree? Uh, this is T2. We have two uh, input trees, and we want to get a union of them. This is T2. If you can, uh, I'll go back to the last one. So this is T2, and this is the smaller one, the blue one is T1. Right. And we use the root of T2 to split T1, mm -hmm. and this uh, two parts will be sent to their children at the recursive call, and we do this until we get the very bottom. Is that clear? Right. I understand the algorithm, but I think what, what does the picture represent? Uh, I mean the next, uh, yes. next row. So what are the nodes of the picture? This is so the, the orange T2. The orange T2 is, is also this one. The same, the same T2, but T1, because of the space, I represent it to be the blue set. I just use the numbers. I don't draw the tree. So the up arrow is the little, uh, little hat thing that, that, that represents some other nodes that might be there. You haven't drawn it's them all out. Right? Uh, this is a small example. The T2 is just this so one, two, three, four, five. Oh, so T1 Sorry? has six nodes, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just a whole tree. Wait, what? T1 has four nodes. Yeah. What are those? What are those? T2 has three. Has <laughs> Why are there six blue nodes in the picture? Okay, oh, that's the camera. Okay. So, <laughs> is that all clear here? Oh, yeah, you put, you put the zero and the four there. I see. Nothing. So, yeah. <laughs> so, is it all clear here? Yeah, right, the, the, the little hat carrots or whatever are empty sets, right? Like oh, yeah, yeah, this, this presents yeah. an yeah, yeah. empty set. Sorry, I didn't explain okay. that. OK, is it all clear here? And here? OK. OK, so at the very bottom, we'll get, we get a base case when one set is empty and the other, and we just directly return the other tree. Okay. Uh huh. Because in the last uh, step, this is an empty, empty set. It's not because six is empty, but because the other one is empty. So it's also a base case. Okay. So color here is basically uh, the blue is the base case and orange is the recursive step. The orange is yeah the blue are base so cases and the orange. So in this picture, the blue was the T T one and orange was T two. <laughs> okay, sorry, I should use another color. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, we'll have another color later. <laughs> okay, so. Each base case takes a constant cost. And we can also see one split can be followed by at most two base cases. So the number of base cases is no more than two times the number of splits. So considering the constant cost, in total, we can get the conclusion that the work on base case can be asymptotically bounded by the total work of split. So in the following analysis, we can just ignore them. After dealing with the base case, the recursive costs go back, and next are the joins. The result of the base cases and then joined in the opposite di direction of the split and after join, one invocation of union gets to the end, and the blue set next to join now represents the result returned by this join. I should use another color <laughs> to show that. But this is also the result returned by its corresponding union. 
And when the recursive call come, goes back to the root, we finish the whole process and get the result. Okay, that clear? Okay. So how about the total work of these drawings? Uh, and here our factor one and two come into handy. With these two facts, we can prove that the join work can also be asymptotically bounded by its corresponding split. Which means that in this computational deck, the join work on this one is no more than the split work on itself. And also for this three, two, seven, and five. So the work of the base cases and the work of all the joins can both be bounded by the work of split. This means that the total cost of union can be asymptotically bounded by the total work of split. Okay, let's take a quick view of split work. We go back to the upper part of the computational deck and the total work of split can be summed up over layers. Remember that the split cost is order of log n. So first, at the root, it is log n. And on layer two, it is a sum of log, the, log, of, uh, log of the sizes of these two smaller trees, which are log t to one plus log t to two. And from the concavity of the log function, we know it is less than two log n over two. And next, it is no more than four times log n over four. And until the bottom, where we have two to the h uh, terms here, and h is the uh, height of t2. So intuitively, if t2 is perfectly balanced, which means that h is exactly log m, there will be log m terms here, and sum over all this should be the optimal bound. But for all the four balancing schemes, they cannot be balanced with such strict condition. And if we add a c here, it will appear in the result here, the power of m, which is very terrible. So what's wrong with this? The problem here is that even at the very bottom of the tree, there can be at most m nodes. If we use two to the c log m to estimate the number of nodes, it would be m to the c, it was too, too loose. So here comes our fact three. With this fact three, we can reorganize the expression in the other direction. And then it will, with a simplified work, it will be the optimal bound. Okay, so this is not a strict proof, and I omit many details here. This is only to show you the roles that factor one, two, three plays in this proof. If you are interested in a strict proof, you can go to our paper. Okay, so that's all about the theory part, and, that, and next I will show you some experimental results. But where is the log m times log n? Uh, that, that was in the theorem before. What's the theorem before? Well, the depth. You didn't, we just doing the work. Oh, yeah, we're uh, only doing the work. You're just doing the work. The depth, you're not doing the depth here. Yeah, depth is, I can simply explain it here. Because with this uh, computational deck, we can see it has log n layers, and in each of them is a split or join, and it's uh, no more than a log m. So the depth is just log m log n. OK, is that clear? <coughs> OK, so next I will show some experimental results. We implemented all the set functions for all four balancing schemes and tested them on a 64-core machine. Our code was compiled with G++ with Silk+. We first showed the speed of our function. 
we tested our union code on m equals to n equals to 100 million for all four balancing schemes, and our algorithm can get up to 46-fold uh, speed up on 64 cores uh, for all the four balancing schemes. Also, notice that our algorithm can also run sequentially and is optimal. We also compared our sequential version with two other sequential implementations from widely used C++ library. The orange line, ST, uh, STD setting STL, and the blue line, the STD vector. This orange line STD set basically uses uh, red-black trees and insert elements in one set in, uh, into the other, which causes order of, order of M log M. And the blue line <coughs> STD vector union two sets in arrays in the merge set uh, style. So it costs, it costs order of M plus N. Finally, our join-based union costs the optimal bound. These two algorithms are the exact algorithms I introduced at the beginning of the talk. So this trend is consistent with the theoretical results, and our implementation is faster than the other two, especially when the union is uh, when union a small set with a large one. When two sets have similar size, ours is slower than STD vector. But this is not surprising since when m equals to n, these two implement implementations are both low n, and their array-based implementation just reads and writes uh, from flat arrays, and therefore has much less overhead and much fewer cast misses. We also compared our algorithm with two other algorithms on different distributions. One is an implementation on weight balance trees, we just call it WBB, and the other one is the multi-core STL, MCSTL, and the red line represents our algorithm. We vary the size of the two trees, and in the figure, we show the result on uniform distribution. Our algorithm and WBB perform similarly on that, even though WBB is sometimes better, ours is also comparable. Actually, WBB does not uh, th does multi insertion of an array of keys into a tree instead of merging two trees. So the better layout of array gives them the advantage of a better catch, uh, of better back catch performance. But it only works on union, not intersection, and it only works on weight balance trees. Also, our code performs better than WBB on some skewed input distributions. For example, when the two sets have less, less overlap, we make the two sets obey the Gaussian distribution on means at 0 and 1, and the standard deviation varying from 1 16th to 1. And the standard deviation is shown on x-axis, and in this case, our algorithm interestingly show better performance, especially when the deviation is small. Actually, small deviation means <coughs> less overlap, and less overlap can simplify the union's problem and should ad ideally reduce the work. What, what does it mean? That, what is the distribution? Uh, this is a Gaussian distribution. Well, the, how does that come into play in the, in the, the algorithm? Oh, mean? no, it's not in the algorithm itself. Okay, we just generate, uh, we generated uh, two sets obey two Gaussian distribution, that means zero and one. And we uh, use different standard deviations. So these two sets have different overlaps in these cases. And we tested to union this kind of two sets, how our algorithm performs. Different over, I see the two sets are <coughs> the elements are picked from two different distributions. Uh, yeah, two different, at different so means. So if they were, for example, not overlapping at all, then the yeah the union is much more efficient because it wouldn't have to yeah. go down multiple paths. And yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the other two algorithms 
can now take advantage of that, and our algorithm can just degenerate to almost a join. So we can perform better in this case. So we also have many other experiments in the paper. You can go to our paper to, uh, if you are interested. OK, that's all for experimental results. Next, a quick summary. In this work, we designed a generic framework for multiple balancing schemes. In practice, we designed, a join, uh, we designed join functions for all the four balancing schemes. And this, functions, uh, this function is the only underlying subroutine that we need to implement, implement differently for different balancing schemes. And all the other code can be reused. We implemented all the functions and tested the performance. Experiments show that our implementation, uh, implementation perfectly matches our theory and achieved good speed up. Also, it is comparable with other existing algorithms on uniform data and especially good on less overlapped data. Not only the code, but the analysis we gave is generic. With the rank defined for each balancing scheme, uh, we showed some good properties of the ranks and the other analysis are identical across balancing schemes. Finally, we show our functions are optimal in work and have polylog depths. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, okay, so uh -huh. I guess you said this already, but I want to make sure that uh -huh. the join is the place that the balancing has to be done. Yes. But not in the other, any of the other functions. You just, no. It's all encapsulated inside the mm -hmm. function. Yes. Okay. Every other function can call join to do this, and they don't need to. Uh -huh. OK. OK. Um, uh -huh. I, I, another question about the, um, the analysis with the, with the two distributions. Uh -huh. Is there a, a theorem about that, about the performance, about how well, I mean, maybe there's some information theoretic uh, yeah. Lower bound or something that and you're, could you? Is there a theorem about that your data structure will achieve some kind of optimality or, or something like that? I don't know. So there was theorem uh, in another work. They proved that uh, to union two sets, the number of comparisons you need to take uh, is decided by the number of different split points, different blocks. So some blocks are unbroken. So the number of blocks, there is a like a formula for that, but I can't remember. Oh, that okay. There was, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe you mentioned, but I missed it. Um, so the depth which you obtain, which is log n times log m, yes. uh, is it optimal, and if so, why? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, there, were, there was work to do that with log n depths, but not optimal work. So currently, the uh, in the current publications, I can find one achieve both optimal work and log n, or just not log m depths. Uh, there are some uh, log, uh, just a log m, but uh, has like m log n work. Yeah. Uh, so you know how like if I want to sort an array and say I'm promised that like all the numbers are between one and n or something, I can actually sort it in linear time using like something like radix sort or something like that uh -huh. just to get around like the comparison lower bound. Uh -huh. um, has there been any work sort of with like these unions and joins that like you uh -huh. know, like if you have if I brought you like these sets are only gonna have numbers between one and like maybe a constant even? Uh, sorry, I I don't know any about that, but I can. That's serious. <laughs> Uh, did you compare with STD B set? Because you compare with STD set, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Do you know STD B set? Oh, we, we didn't. No. Uh, okay, because it's probably kind of different, but I'm curious. Uh -huh. Just, uh, that was more efficient in B, uh -huh. B set. STD B set. B set, okay, I can look at that. Up. Yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, in your implementation, is it a functional implementation? N no, it's 
it's uh, actually we implemented a library, but these are just to show some experimental results. I didn't focus on that. We uh, we implemented persistent version, non-persistent version. If that's what you mean. Which, which? persistent version? Do you mean that? Persistent, no. yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so so we have both versions. We have both versions. We can do it in place or in a persistent way. By probably doesn't make that much difference. Uh, you know, you don't want no. Find where the code either because it's. Uh huh. We we use a reference counting to keep the persistent version. Uh, does that answer okay. our question? Okay. okay.